Welcome to the CIHR Team in Children's Pain and CAFC webinar series on children's pain. This is episode 3 of this series, titled, Kids Get Chronic Pain 2, Assessment and Management of Pediatric Chronic Pain. The series on children's pain is a multi-part series looking at a variety of issues in children's pain, including current knowledge and attitudes towards pain, and management and assessment of pain in infants, children, and youth. The CIHR Team in Children's Pain the Translating Research on Pain and Children Project and this webinar series are funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. All of the presenters that have taken part in this series have had no financial relationships to disclose or any conflicts of interest. Other episodes that have been presented in this, epi in this series on children's pain include From Pokes to Post-Op, an Overview of Pain Prevention and Management in Hospitalized Children by Drs. Bonnie Stevens and Fiona Campbell. Reducing Pain in Infants and Young Children During Pokes and Other Procedures by Drs. Denise Harrison, Christine Chambers, and Janet Yamada. And today's episode, Kids Get Chronic Pain 2, Assessment and Management of Pediatric Chronic Pain by Drs. Jennifer Stinson, Alan Finley, Bruce Dick, and Ann Ailing Campos. Information on all of these episodes in this series can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network at www.ken.cafc.org. I'm Doug Maynard, Associate Director at the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers, and welcome to Episode 3, Kids Get Chronic Pain 2, Assessment and Management of Pediatric Chronic Pain. Uh, first up, we will have uh, Dr. Jennifer Stinson. Uh, Dr. Stinson is uh, an Assistant Professor in the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. She's a Clinician Scientist in Child Health Evaluative Sciences and an Advanced Practice Nurse in the Chronic Pain Program in the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Her major clinical research interests are in the area of pain and symptom management and the use of e-health technologies to improve the assessment and management of pain and other symptoms in children with chronic illnesses. Uh, Dr. Stinson developed and tested a multidimensional uh, electronic pain diary for children with chronic pain for her PhD dissertation. She recently received a Career Scientist Award from the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care for her research on using e-health to promote chronic disease self-management in youth with chronic health conditions. She's made over 50 presentations about the broad area of chronic pain and has 31 publications to her credit. And Jennifer is a co-investigator on the CIHR team in children's pain. Uh, following uh, Dr. Stinson, we'll have uh, Dr. Alan Finley, who's a professor of anesthesia and psychology at Dalhousie University. He's the inaugural Dr. Stuart Wenning Chair in Pediatric Pain Management at the IWK Health Center and is the medical director of Pediatric Pain Management and the Pediatric Complex Pain Clinic. His research interests include all areas of pediatric pain, but particularly pediatric pain service development around the world. He is the co-leader of the Child Kind International Initiative, and the link is on the screen there, but also on the Knowledge Exchange Network if you're looking for, uh, for that type of information. Uh, following Dr. Finley, uh, it will be uh, Dr. Bruce Dick, who's an associate professor in the departments of anesthesia and pain medicine and psychiatry at the University of Alberta. He's a clinical psychologist who also provides clinical uh, services in the pediatric chronic pain clinic at Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta. His research focuses on the effects of chronic pain on a number of factors, including cognitive function, disability, sleep, stigmatization of patients, and quality of life. Other research interests include distance treatment programs for individuals with pain and their families, educational programs aimed at improving clinical outcomes, and population factors associated with chronic pain. Uh, Anne, uh, following uh, Dr. Dick is Anne Ailing Campos, who is a physiotherapist with the chronic pain program in the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Her primary role is that of clinician providing assessment and management to children and adolescents uh, with chronic per and persistent pain. She has just recently started her uh, started presenting and contributing to the pediatric pain education and publications. So with all of that, uh, I'm now going to hand the presentation over to Dr. Stinson uh, to start uh, to start this presentation. Over to you, Dr. Stinson. Great. So as um uh, Doug said, um, this is the third in a series of web seminars um, from the Tropic Pain Group. Um, and he's outlined the presenters, so I will go first in terms of 
talking about the epidemiology and consequences um, of chronic pain and review the components of a comprehensive pain assessment. Um, and then as the other speakers will speak on um, management of chronic pain in children using the three P's. So Dr. Finley will talk about pharmacological approaches, Dr. Dick will talk about psychological approaches, and Anne will speak to physical therapies. So in terms of my talk, I want to talk um, briefly about what the differences are between acute pain and chronic pain, talk a little bit about the epidemiology of chronic pain in children, and describe the steps that one would take in a comprehensive assessment of a pediatric uh, chronic pain patient. So the first thing um, to look at is try to distinguish what are some of the defining uh, features of acute pain versus chronic pain. And we'll start off with a poll question first. So which of the following statements about chronic pain is false? A, serves no productive function. B, usually has a single obvious cause. C, lasts beyond the time of normal healing, or D, the pain intensity is often out of proportion to the objective findings. Okay, so 64% um, put B, that it usually has a single obvious cause. So in terms of chronic pain, chronic pain is really considered a state or a condition where pain persists beyond the usual course of an acute disease or healing of an injury or, or that may be associated with an acute um, condition. Um, it also um, has multiple causative or triggering factors unlike acute pain where there's often usually just a single obvious cause of tissue damage, a burn, a fracture. In chronic pain, we have multiple types of pain that can happen. We can have nociceptive pain, which is normal pain. We can have neuropathic or nerve pain or a combination of both types of pains. Um, and there's usually often <clears throat> psychological or psychosocial factors that can contribute um, to chronic pain in children. So unlike acute pain where there's a protective function that it serves and you see activation of the sympathetic nervous system with acute pain in terms of increased respiratory rate or sweating, increased blood pressure, in chronic pain it really doesn't serve a protective function or warn us from injury and it's rarely accompanied by activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So you don't see that increased heart rate and respiratory rate because those adapt or habituate over time. With chronic pain, it's usually longer lasting. Um, as I said, it, it, it proceeds or uh, persists beyond the normal time of healing. It can be associated with chronic diseases, whereas acute pain is often short-lived in terms of procedural pain can be a few minutes to you know days with surgery, et cetera. And with chronic pain, <clears throat> we often see that the proportion of um, the pain intensity or how much this hurts is often out of sync or out of keeping with our objective physical findings that we see on exam. In terms of treatment, usually with acute pain, it's easy to treat. You can often use a single modality, like give a medication or apply heat or cold. Whereas with chronic pain, it's much more difficult to treat and it requires a multidisciplinary, multimodal approach, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And again, in terms of outcomes, acute pain is usually expected to resolve when healing occurs, whereas with chronic pain, the pain um, continues to persist in a significant proportion of the population. And in a small proportion of kids that do develop chronic pain, they will go on to develop significant pain-related disability in about 5 to 8 percent of children. The American Pain Society um, has published a statement which can be found on their website and it's in the references um, regarding a position statement on chronic pain in children. 
and they really define chronic pain as the result of a, a dynamic integration of both biological processes, psychological factors, and socio-cultural context that needs to be considered within a developmental trajectory. And that chronic pain really includes both persistent or ongoing pain and recurrent pain that's episodic, for example, headaches or recurrent abdominal pain. And with, in both of those types of pain, there can be fluctuations in the severity, so how much it hurts, the quality, the regularity, and the predictability of it. And again, it can occur in single or multiple body regions and can involve single or multiple organ systems. So our next poll question is, what is the most common chronic pain problem in children? Is it A, headaches, B, low back pain, C, abdominal pain, or D, complex regional pain syndrome, which is a type of neuropathic pain? So again, if I can... So 65% of respondents uh, stated that uh, abdominal pain was the most common type of pain in ch chronic pain in children. So in terms of the epidemiology or how common chronic pain is in children, very little is really known about it compared to what we know about chronic pain in adults. However, from several large population studies, um, the prevalence estimates range anywhere from 3% for back pain to 97% for migraine headaches. Um, and thus, chronic pain is common in children and adolescents. It's estimated that about 15 to 20 percent of children will experience some type of chronic pain. And children and their families experience significant emotional and social consequences because of this pain and disability. And the financial costs of childhood pain also may be significant in terms of healthcare utilization, utilization as well as other indirect costs such as lost wages due to time off work to care for their children. <clears throat> In addition, the psychological and physical consequences of chronic pain may impact the child's overall health and may, provoke, may predispose them to continue to have chronic pain as an adult. And so the most common chronic pain conditions are a headache is the most frequent, followed by abdominal pain, followed by musculoskeletal pains. And then, as I mentioned, there's a subgroup of children with recurrent and persistent pain that will develop significant pain-related disability that increases with age. So these are kids who, for example, have a chronic pain condition, who are no longer at school, who have withdrawn from seeing their peers or engaging in any hobbies or activities um, that they enjoy. Chronic pain has been reported in children as young in three, but it's most prevalent in um, the early teens and is uh, much more common in girls compared to boys. So in terms of the types of chronic pain that you can see in children, it can be related to diseases such as sickle cell disease or arthritis, cancer. It can be related to injury-related pain such as burns, fractures, or post-operative um, pain that can occur with uh, amputation of a limb such as phantom pain, which again is a type of neuropathic pain. There's lots of nonspecific or unexplained benign chronic pain conditions such as headaches, recurrent abdominal pain, low back pain, widespread chronic pain. And there's also somatoform um, disorders, but these are very, very rare um, that can result in pain conditions such as conversion disorders or pain disorders. So in terms of the main types of pain, they can be distinguished in between nociceptive pain, which is normal pain, or the ordinary pain cessation that arises from an injury or damage to some part of our body other than the nerve tissue itself. It tends to be usually sharp or aching um, in nature, and it's well localized. This type of pain usually responds quite well to non-opioids, um, such as um, anti-inflammatories or um, acetaminophen or opioids, and it can arise in um, bones, joints, muscles, connective tissue, as well as visceral 
um, pain from organs such as the stomach. Whereas neuropathic pain arises from the nervous system itself, so injury to the nerve or disease to the nerves. It's often described by patients as being burning, shooting, throbbing, um, and it can lead to heightened sensitivity to stimuli. For example, patients with this type of pain will often complain that very light touch, even with a Kleenex, is painful, um, and that's called allodynia. Um, it tends to be much more difficult to treat. Uh, treatment usually involves adjuvant analgesics, which Dr. Finley will go over. Um, and some examples of neuropathic pain are phantom limb pain, um, peripheral neuropathies, um, et cetera, complex regional pain syndrome. And often children with chronic pain can have a combination of both nociceptive and neuropathic pain. So in terms of assessing chronic pain, <clears throat> we'll start off with a poll question before we get into the details of the components of a comprehensive assessment. So poll question three is when evaluating a child's chronic pain, which of the following is most important to assess? A, the pain characteristics. B, the level of functional impairment the child has. C, psychological contributors to the pain, D, current and past pain control strategies, or E, all of the above. Oh, you guys are wonderful. 100% got E, correct answer. Okay, so in terms of the goals of pain assessment, there are really three main ones. The first one is really to describe the pain that the child has and the factors that are influencing it and potentially maintaining it. Um, it helps to assist in the diagnosis of the chronic pain problem, and it helps you to develop an appropriate um, pain management plan um, depending, and it helps guide the type of therapies that you want to choose, whether it's pharmacological, psychological, or physical, or a combination of all. And it helps you um, develop goalposts to evaluate the effectiveness of your interventions or plan that you develop with the patient. So in terms of the assessment of pain, we really need to do a biopsychosocial um, comprehensive assessment. And um, this model just helps me to sort of frame some of the key things that you really want to look at when doing an assessment in terms of some of the child factors, their age, their cognitive level, their culture, and how that might influence their experience of pain. Some of the psychological factors, such as coping style, um, any problems with anxiety or mood that might be impacting on their pain, environmental factors, their ability to go to school, their interaction with their peers, how disabled are they by the, their pain, um, et cetera. <clears throat> so in terms of doing a comprehensive pain assessment, it should include a detailed history of the pain. There should be uh, appropriate medical examination and physical examination done, and any diagnostic testing that needs to be done, but by the time these kids usually end up in tertiary chronic pain centers, they've undergone almost every single diagnostic test that they can undergo, and so usually you don't need to do any further diagnostic testing. You need to evaluate during your history any probable involvement of both nociceptive or neuropathic mechanisms in terms of their pain. And it's really important to appraise some of the situational factors that may be contributing to a child's pain, such as their knowledge about what's causing their pain problem, um, et cetera. And again, we need to do the uh, initial assessment, but we need to um, do ongoing the assessment of their pain, evaluating the therapies. In terms of sensory characteristics, it's important to figure out where they hurt, how much they hurt, the quality or what word descriptors they would use to describe the pain, how long the pain lasts when they get it, is it constant or intermittent, is it accompanied by any other symptoms, does it change based on the season, the weather, what things make the pain worse and what things make the pain better. You also need to really um, explore in more detail um, aspects of pain-related disability. So how is this pain affecting their ability to sleep, their mood, 
their ability to go into school, to see their friends, maintain peer relationships, the hobbies or sports that they were involved before, um, are they doing any physical exercise, um, and what are their relationships like now with their um, peers and family. In terms of uh, psychological factors, it's really important to find out what potential stressors may be aggravating the pain. Have there been any recent, you know, loss or deaths in the family? Um, how, do the, how does the patient feel about their pain? Are they frustrated? Are they more sad and down because of it and how it's impacting their life? It's important to explore the child and the parent's belief about what's causing the pain. Um, and what they've been told about its prognosis um, and treatment. And again, it's important to really uh, understand if there's any psychological factors which may be contributing to the pain, such as anxiety disorders, mood disorders, and there's lots of screening measures that can be used um, to screen for this. Um, but you can just ask them um, these questions. Again, <clears throat> um, usually during the first um, uh, assessment we have with patients, um, the families are, uh, one family member is invited in. It's important to find out if there's a family history um, of chronic pain uh, in the immediate family. It's also important to find out if the child has had previous experiences uh, with any other types of recurrent pain such as headaches or stomach aches and how they coped with those. Um, in terms of the assessment, it's also important to review um, any current treatments um, that are being used for pain as well as past treatments and how effective they were in managing the pain. So it's important to review any medications that were used in terms of over-the-counter medications. Um, did they use opioids or have they tried neuropathic pain medications um, such as anticonvulsants? Have they done any physical therapies uh, in terms of seeing a physical therapist? Have they done massage or acupuncture? Have they used heat or cold? Have they done any um, psychological strategies? They may be engaging in relaxation or distraction in terms of being involved with music or watching video games or reading. And have they actually seen anyone um, to learn strategies uh, in terms of um, cognitive behavioral therapies, and it's also really important to ask patients about their use of complementary and alternative medicines. So in terms of the final poll question, most of the time there is no answer to what initially caused the child's pain. A, true, or B, the statement is false. So if everyone can vote. So it looks like it's a gold split between 51% uh, uh, that this statement is true and 49% that it is false. So in terms of doing your assessment, it's really important um, to feedback to the family um, that for the majority of cases, there's often no answer to what initially caused the pain. Um, however, it's really important to say, state that failure to detect anything serious or bad um, should really be reframed in a positive, that all the tests came back ne negative, there's nothing serious to worry about, and the focus really at this point is not really what caused it, or sh it shouldn't be what on what caused it, but on how we can help get you, your child back um, to a normal life um, and help to reduce um, the symptoms, but the focus really should be returning the child back to a normal life and um, function. So the assessment is really about gathering all this information in order to develop a plan that you can negotiate um, with the family. And then my colleagues are going to talk to you about the potential three Ps that you can use in developing a plan. But now I will just see if there are any questions um, regarding um, the causes of pain or um, components of a pain assessment. Hey Jennifer, uh, there actually haven't been any questions in. And, uh, okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, just before I hand over to Dr. Finley, I just wanted to remind everyone if you do have any questions related to Jennifer's presentation, 
um, or any of the presentations as we go along, don't hesitate to type them into the question box and uh, we'll be happy to try and answer them. And if you have any questions related to Dr. Stinson's presentation, there will be some time at the end where, we'll, where we will be taking questions. So if you think of questions related to the content you just heard, uh, don't hesitate to put those questions in any time during the presentation and we'll make sure we try and get you an answer. So I'm just going to hand over the presentation to uh, Dr. Finley, uh, coming to us from uh, the IWK Health Center and Dalhousie University in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Over to you, Dr. Finley. Thanks very much. Uh, can you, everybody hear me okay, I trust? I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the drugs used in pediatric chronic pain management. Um, first, I wanted to... Uh, just give you a bit of a, a grab bag list of some of the problems that we see in these clinics. Uh, there's the, the common issues of uh, chronic widespread pain, which may, be, uh, may incorporate what people sometimes call fibromyalgia. We have perif uh, peripheral neuralgias, uh, nerve injuries from, that are obviously from surgery or trauma. Uh, complex regional pain syndrome, as Jennifer was talking about. Um, and <laughs> what I categorize as weird neuropathies, um, which include uh, a wide variety of things that we usually can't figure out. <clears throat> um, we get referrals from the rheumatologists for patients with joint pain that's not related to active arthritis. Um, there's some background noise, I'm afraid. I don't know where that's coming from. Um, and then varieties of uh, abdominal pain, um, visceral hyperalgesia, back pain, headache, um, and uh, problems with children with neurological impairment. Now, just to uh, put this in context, remember that most of the patients who end up in pediatric complex pain clinics have been um, through a, a range of other attempts to solve their problem. And uh, so the family's been through a pretty rough time frequently. They've gone to many different health professionals, physicians and non-physicians. They've gotten conflicting advice. Uh, they've been accused of having uh, um, emotional uh, problems or, or having uh, uh, episodes of child abuse or uh, family issues that are contributing to the pain, um, which, is, uh, which are almost certainly uh, not uh, true. And of course, even their friends and family always have good suggestions and, and the answer to their problems. Uh, most of which uh, conflict with each other. So it's pretty frustrating for them, and they will come uh, with some degree of suspicion and uh, uh, concern that you're not going to believe them or that you're not going to uh, take them seriously. The first goal in our mind is to establish the trust and the therapeutic relationship and show that we believe the family and the patient. <coughs> uh, basically, uh, if I believe the patient and they're in the very small percentage, a uh, couple of percentage of a uh, uh, couple of percent of kids who are actually faking or making things up, I'll figure that out eventually. But if I accuse them of fabricating, uh, we're in there in the 95 plus percent who are absolutely telling the truth, I'll totally destroy any chance of having a good relationship with them. When we do our physical exam, we're very careful not to cause more pain. Um, again, that's a common experience that kids have had. We offer reasonable hope. We don't promise to take away the pain 100%, but we usually can be sure that we can help it somewhat, and most importantly, that we can help them get back to the life that they want and do the things they want to do. As any of you who work with teenagers know, uh, Adolescents uh, aren't children, uh, but they aren't adults either, uh, and uh, really are uh, sometimes a different species and uh, very challenging, but also a lot of fun to work with. 
as Jen mentioned, um, we try and combine uh, combine uh, psychological, phys physical, and pharmacological approaches, and we try and present that as a single package. That helps validate, uh, particularly the psychological treatments, which some families are uh, frightened of. Uh, we feel that these uh, different techniques will have synergistic effects, but we we emphasize self-efficacy and self-management. And most importantly, perhaps, the families appreciate getting the whole uh, package plan in, in one sitting uh, and not having to tell their story uh, over and over again to different uh, health professionals. So I've got three poll questions here. We'll go through one right after the other, and then we'll uh, talk about uh, the implications of them. Uh, the first uh, prov provocative question is, uh, teenagers complain about pain to get access to drugs, uh, A, frequently, B, occasionally, or C, almost never? Results. You should see it by now, but uh, the, uh, the answers what we've got so far are 2% said frequently, 39% uh, said occasionally, and 60% said almost never. Oh, there we go. Okay, I, by coming out of my screen, I was able to find it. And uh, yes, and I would say uh, almost never is certainly our experience. And uh, uh, the, 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 the myth of the teenager who's fabricating pain reports to get extra drugs is a really rare event. Second one, <coughs> uh, opioid drugs are effective in neuropathic pain always, occasionally, or never. And we have 70% on that, which I would think is a pretty uh, reasonable guess. Uh, certainly, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, uh, again, there's a bit of a myth that opioids never work in neuropathic pain. That's certainly untrue. But it's also clear that they're not as effective in uh, many cases as we'd like them to be. So, if you're trying to figure out whether a kid is uh, fabricating their pain, is it uh, reasonable to give them a uh, placebo and tell them it's an opioid uh, to see whether they have really got real pain or not, true or false? And we have, we have Quarter to quarter three quarters, three quarters uh, uh, voting, voting versus true versus false. false. So let's, so let's move on. on. Um, so what are we trying to do with medications in these patients? Um, I, I approach it as, as having three goals. Uh, the first is to try and decrease the current pain they have, if possible. <clears throat> that may or may not be uh, uh, possible in all cases. The second is to try and reduce any further nerve sensitization um, that has that is occurring as a result of chronic pain and uh, inflammation. Um, the uh, if you look back at the uh, American Pain Society um, physician statement on pediatric chronic pain. Uh, you'll note that it has uh, some language about uh, the fact that all long-standing pain has at least uh, neuro, uh, neurosensory involvement, uh, no matter what the er original cause. Uh, and just to respond to the uh, to poll about placebo, in fact, uh, placebo is not a good test of effective of the reality of pain. Uh, it's well recognized that the placebo response is a, is a real neurophysiological response. If a patient's expecting to get relief, then they will uh, get uh, a, a neurological response to uh, taking the medication. Normally, it won't last very long if, uh, if the drug isn't, the, uh, uh, isn't a real effective drug. But just because a patient feels better after taking a placebo does not mean they're fabricating, and it may, in fact, may mean exactly the opposite. It's felt that using a deceptive placebo, telling a patient they're getting morphine when they're really getting saline, 
is actually an unethical approach to uh, pain management and should not be used. So in terms of categories of drugs, we'll look first at the drugs that everybody's familiar with as anti-inflammatory drugs or <coughs> mostly over-the-counter uh, type uh, pain drugs, uh, both the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like uh, naproxen, ibuprofen, diclofenac, and celecoxib, as well as acetaminophen or paracetamol. Um, all of these drugs can be effective for some types of pain. Uh, often I find patients come in saying they've tried ibuprofen but it didn't work. Uh, you don't you usually have to do some history to find out whether they've actually used an effective dose or used a, a dose that's long enough. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, um, many of these uh, pain conditions combine both nociceptive, in other words, mechanical inflammatory type pain uh, with neuropathic pain so that one of these drugs may be helpful, but it may not be the whole answer. Um, we feel that uh, the majority of these patients have some degree of nerve uh, sensitization and so there is in effect a neuropathic component to the pain even if it's not in the category that people think of as classically neuropathic. Um, gabapentin and pregabalin uh, we find are very useful even though they're not uh, normally uh, labeled for uh, pain relief in children. Uh, in, in many countries gabapentin is labeled for use in children as an anticonvulsant uh, an anti-epileptic. Um, but uh, I don't think it's used all that often for epilepsy anymore. It's very effective in some cases of peripheral nerve injury or peripheral neuropathy. And in adult guidelines is um, recommended as one of the first line drugs in neuropathic pain. Uh, we feel that the dangerous side effects are pretty minimal. Um, some uh, kids get dizziness, fatigue, and difficulty concentrating or remembering things. In most of them, that goes away after a few days. In some, it's incapacitating and they have to stop the uh, medication. Uh, they're pretty clean drugs. They're renally excreted. They're not metabolized. They don't really interact with any other medications, which makes them pretty safe to use in almost any circumstance. <laughs> we start uh, with a low dose and work up, uh, particularly in gabapentin, because of the uh, problem of more severe side effects if you start too big a dose too soon. Pregabalin seems to have similar effects. Um, we don't find very many patients who have a more pronounced response to um, uh, pregabalin than they do to gabapentin. Um, it may have fewer side effects in some patients and it's probably a bit more convenient for some kids because the dosing is twice a day instead of three times a day. Um, for uh, the kids who have very active after school uh, extracurricular uh, lives, um, expecting them to, to take a a pill in the middle of the afternoon may be a lost cause, so pregabalin might be help may be helpful in those circumstances. <coughs> the other class of drugs that's most commonly described as being useful for uh, neuropathic pain are the antidepressants and the older an tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline or nortriptyline are clearly more effective than uh, SSRIs, than the, the, the newer ones that are more commonly used in psychiatry these days. <coughs> um, amitriptyline can certainly cause problems in children who already have a cardiac conduction defect, so we usually do a screening electrocardiogram to look for prolonged QT syndrome uh, before 
starting or at least before uh, increasing the dose very much. Um, again, uh, we generally start at a lowish dose and increase over time depending on response. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into details about dosing for all the opioids uh, because that would uh, take much more time than we have available. Um, certainly there are patients for whom opioids are both effective and appropriate. There is nothing inherently evil about being on long-term uh, regular opioids if that's what it takes to relieve pain and uh, return someone to an active normal uh, life. Uh, it is, however, usually a late choice in pediatric patients and uh, many of the conditions we see, uh, even when we get to the point of trying opioids, we find that they're not all that useful. Uh, in general, we, if we are using them, we try and use uh, a slow-release form, so either methadone or uh, a slow-release morphine or hydromorphone or uh, fentanyl patch, mostly for convenience and also to avoid the ups and downs of intermittent uh, immediate release uh, dosing. Um, you will hear people talking about ketamine uh, for neuropathic pain. Um, it can clearly be effective uh, as an intravenous infusion for patients with severe pain in hospital and as a uh, really uh, very potent adjuvant to opioids that seems to help reduce opioid resistance. Um, but um, although some people have started to use it by mouth long term in outpatients, there are some concerns about um, long, longer term side effects with that kind of use and I don't think the jury is yet in as to whether it's uh, safe for uh, prolonged use in uh, otherwise healthy kids. Uh, there's been some work on adults uh, using a topical preparation of ketamine and amitriptyline um, as uh, shown here at the bottom. Uh, there's not been any research done on kids so it's hard to say whether it's effective for the types of pain that we see in uh, children and adolescents. So I just wanted to touch basically on, on the principles or the philosophies here. <coughs> uh, we try and combine medications based on what we presume are the mechanisms, not specifically where, what the location of the pain is. So if the pain is uh, clearly got an inflammatory mechanical component, then non-steroidals and opioids will be useful and effective. Um, if it's harder to pin that down or if it's clearly got a neurological uh, component, then anticonvulsants, um, tricyclics may be helpful um, or the, the pain may have uh, multiple mechanisms and you're going to get the best effect by combining a number of different drugs. Often we're in the situation of saying, um, we're not sure what this is exactly, we're going to try this drug and this drug, and if we get a better result with gabapentin than we do with naproxen, then we're going to assume that that um, supports a neuropathic component to the pain, and uh, that will help us with our uh, with the etiology as well as with the uh, treatment. I wanted to make a point here that we rarely do nerve blocks for pediatric chronic pain. Um, there is absolutely zero research evidence to support their use in chronic pain in kids. And uh, talking to people who do the same sort of job that I do in other centers, it's clear that the uh, enthusiasm that people did have for epidurals and sympathetic blocks uh, has uh, faded away. That's not to say that they're never used, but only for very specific um, uh, cases that uh, you, uh, in, in very rare circumstances. So 
remember that drugs are an adjunct. Um, they need to be combined with other methods, the psychological and physical methods. Beware of setting yourself up for, uh, as I said, the magic bullet expectation. Uh, don't ever say this drug is going to is going to cure your pain, uh, because uh, when you're wrong, uh, you've just uh, dealt have have to deal with a patient who's uh, feel like there's um, that you've let them down or that you've uh, made promises you can't fulfill. So uh, we try and take a guarded approach and try and work on the principle of increasing function and getting them back to doing the things that they want to do in life. So that's all the slides I had. Um, there are a couple questions, so I'll just uh, deal with those if uh, you wish, uh, both about placebo. Sure, I'll just hand the uh, presentation uh, over to uh, Dr. Bruce Dick while, while you're answering those questions, and we'll let him get ready to, uh, to go. So okay. go ahead and answer those questions. Sure. There's two questions about placebo. One, whether there's an ethical way to use them. And the second is, uh, it, is it uh, unethical to use a placebo test with parent consent if you're working with an adolescent? Could not this not be a way of determining if other therapies are effective? Um, <clears throat> so in a clinical setting like this where you're deceiving the patient, I don't think there's an ethical way to use placebo um, in any age of patient. And having the parent approve it is still deceiving the, the child or the teenager, and I don't think that's uh, acceptable. Um, there are, if you put somebody on a regular medication, I can guarantee that often enough they will come back and say, oh, you know what, I missed, a, I missed uh, two doses last week and my pain got worse. Um, they'll, they'll do that test for you, but giving them a sugar pill and suggesting that it's a pain medicine to see whether they get a response is neither gives you the answer you're looking for, nor is a way of establishing trust and a therapeutic uh, relationship. So, and I don't think parents can be the proxies for that. Um, it's different in a s research setting where you're saying you may get a placebo or you may get a treatment. I, none of us know which it's going to be. That's not, the, that's not what we're talking about here. <clears throat> Conceivably, you could say to a patient, I want you to take a week of this and a week of that, and one of them is the real drug but I don't really think that's going to help you very much. But you could only do it if the patient absolutely knew that they were undergoing that kind of trial, and I don't think it helps you therapeutically. Um, I don't see other, any other questions at the moment, but uh, save them up, and uh, we can certainly uh, talk about them at the end. So I'll sign off now, and thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Finley. And we'll now go over to Dr. Bruce Dick uh, at the uh, Stollery Children's Hospital and University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta. Over to you, Dr. Dick. Welcome, everyone. I'm uh, very pleased to be able to speak today about psychological in interventions for chronic pain. I think, first of all, it's important that I acknowledge Dr. Patrick McGraw, who uh, originally was slated to provide this presentation and was kind enough to share uh, the slides, some of the slides that I'll, uh, that I'll share with you today. Here are the objectives of uh, what I'll be sharing today. First of all, to, um, for the audience to help increase all of our understanding of psychological interventions that are useful for young people with chronic pain. How these interventions uh, can contribute positively to chronic pain management within, uh, within a team setting, ideally. Um, in doing this, I'll review some of the major psychological approaches to pain management in uh, children and teens. I'll discuss uh, some of the practical applications of these approaches as I discuss each of the different kinds of uh, strategies and also how that they might all be used together in a, in a program-based uh, approach. And finally, I'll very briefly discuss uh, some of the process of this, uh, of how one might use these together, how, how a team might use these different sorts of strategies together, and some of the key outcomes that um, have been seen in research across the world 
and also clinically in our own program here at, uh, at Stollery. I'm actually going to start with my poll questions at the beginning. Um, Depression and anxiety in children and teens with chronic pain, A, tends to be a primary cause of chronic pain, or B, uh, tends to be a primary uh, effect of having chronic pain when you look across populations. So, but the, uh, the responses are 4% uh, said tends to be a primary cause of chronic pain, and 96% said tends to primarily be an effect of having chronic pain. Great, thanks. And, uh, and yeah, to the audience, you are overwhelmingly uh, correct in terms of what we've seen and uh, what studies have found. Um, generally speaking, there's no question that depression and anxiety is more common in young people who experience chronic pain, as is the case with many people who experience chronic diseases. Um, what's important to recognize is that the majority of those young people uh, deal with these mood, mood problems as a result of having a complex health problem and, uh, and not the reverse. There obviously and certainly are young people who have um, pre-morbid depression and anxiety that, that is very important to be aware of as well. Uh, the next poll question is a true or false question. Um, children with chronic pain are more likely to have a history of abuse, either f physical or sexual, than those without chronic pain. So the results are in. 26% um, of the audience said true, and 74% of the audience said false. Great. Thanks, Doug. Our, our experience has been, and, and the research would suggest, that, um, that children with chronic pain are no more likely to have a history of, of abuse. Um, certainly, if uh, as we work with young people, there are flags that would suggest that a young person has been abused. It's very important for us to recognize that and to help them to... Uh, receive appropriate treatment. But unfortunately, this is a myth that uh, continues periodically to rear its, its ugly head, uh, often um, uh, causing problems for, for the young person and even for their family members. Now, we've seen the three Ps come up a few times, and, and I have a quote here that the current evidence suggests that a multimodal approach involving pharmacologic, physical, and psychological therapies within a flexible program tend to have the best outcomes. In, uh, in managing pain in young people. And that's certainly been our experience here at, at Stollery, and the research would, would certainly support that. Now, the psychological interventions that I'll, that I'll discuss today, I'll talk about some general principles and how those principles can be integrated within those medical and physical treatments that you've heard about already and that you will hear about uh, shortly um, in, in our next presentation. We found that where available interdisciplinary approaches have been very helpful and, and very effective, and there's good data to support that as well. It's critical, obviously, that as we provide this sort of care, that it be patient-centered and, and not solely based upon um, the, the actual provider. And, and obviously, using the best evidence that's available, the research that's been provided, such as the publication noted at the bottom of this slide, a systematic review by Chris Eccleson and colleagues, is really critical as we decide what to do um, how we'll act as individuals, um, whether we be healthcare providers, uh, family members, friends, whoever that might be in, uh, in helping these young people with these uh, serious medical problems. Now these are the psychological methods that I'll discuss today, uh, some at, at greater length than others. They include patient education, um, CBT or cognitive behavior therapy, relaxation, uh, conditioning methods including operant and classical conditioning, uh, and other sorts of approaches. As well, I'll briefly talk about uh, some programs that can capitalize on many of those uh, different sorts of, of treatments. One of the things that, um, that we do here at Stollery and that many programs across the world do um, is, is teach the young people, the child, the, the adolescent, and their family members about what chronic pain is really all about from a biopsychosocial context. And, uh, I think personally one of the things that I enjoy a, a great deal as a part of this process as a psychologist is engaging in that, in that teaching. We found that this is a very, very important part of, of the whole psychological process and the whole team process. And we're also completing some research right now aimed at understanding how this teaching actually is, is useful. Now this teaching typically centers on uh, sharing what we understand of the anatomy and physiology of pain. And, and as we do that, we try to really emphasize concepts that have already been presented by Dr. Stinson and, and uh, Dr. Finley already, that it's very possible to hurt a great deal and not necessarily 
to be experiencing any biological harm. Uh, that's one of the, the key problems with chronic pain that can become so disabling for many young people. It's important that we also teach that in, in addition to a focus on good physical medicine, be that uh, pharmacology or, or physiotherapy or other sorts of physical interventions, there are other things that we can do behaviorally and psychologically uh, that, that are effective to help young people with pain. We do provide very important teaching about medications at the level of the young person, wherever their developmental level might be. And we strive, if we can, to help support both children and their parents to become advocates for themselves, uh, for their family, within their communities, within their schools, and even in, in the hospitals and other healthcare environments. Cognitive behavior therapy is probably one of the more widely used psychological therapies, and it certainly seems to have been the most widely researched psychological intervention for chronic pain. This therapy focuses on the link between things that happen uh, in a young person's world, the thoughts that uh, are experienced by the young person when they deal with a health problem or other difficulties, how those thoughts and events affect their, their mood, their feelings, and how that all of these factors interplay with their behavior. Each of these factors play an important role in, in health. And uh, as we work to help young people recognize those factors and how those factors affect them and affect their health, we give them the opportunity to have more control over their pain and, and thereby their lives. A, a key focus of CBT, or cognitive behavior therapy, is the way that we think about pain. This pain is very real, and it's unusual for the vast majority of people to experience pain that doesn't signal that there's something very wrong in the body. And when one engages in a very simple activity, some mild exercise, these young people can experience anywhere from a low level of pain to, for many of the kids that we see, a tremendous amount of pain. Our brains understandably interpret that to mean that there's something very wrong with our bodies. And uh, as Dr. Finley has nicely discussed today, there is something that's typically wrong with the central nervous system, be that central sensitization or other sorts of neurological processes. But oftentimes, um, in terms of the musculoskeletal system, there may not be anything uh, at least detectively wrong. A very important part of CBT also is teaching and things that one can do with one's thoughts, with one's mind, changing the way that we think about pain, changing the way that we perceive pain, and the way that we approach and, and cope with difficulties that, uh, that young people have. Some of the important components of this restructuring can be recognizing triggers, the activating events, um, things that might exacerbate a young person's pain, helping them recognize those things, beliefs that affect their pain and also how they approach their pain and cope with it, the consequences of their pain, and whether or not they feel confident or comfortable in trying to manage their pain through behavioral strategies, and also challenging some of the unhelpful thoughts or beliefs that, that they might have. It's very common for a young person experiencing significant pain to, uh, as I mentioned before, to have uh, feelings of depression or, or worry. And sometimes those mood problems lead to distorted thinking and oftentimes to hopelessness. And so disputing or challenging some of these negative thoughts can be very powerful and very helpful for a young person with a complicated health problem. CBT in a nutshell can be very simply displayed in this way. The focus of CBT is thoughts and changing thoughts, and by doing that we can positively affect uh, or help a young person affect their mood and also the way that they approach and, and cope with their pain. One of the, the many primary focuses that we try to help many young people with, and, and oftentimes their parents as well, is uh, what's been labeled as catastrophic thinking or catastrophizing. This sort of thinking involves three main components. Rumination, which is uh, difficulty people have in disengaging from a recurring thought. Magnification uh, of, the, of the impact, the current impact and the potential impact of pain. And also a, a feeling of helplessness or hopelessness, such that they may not feel that there's anything that they could do about the pain and that they're having significant difficulties coping with their pain. While we try to help them restructure the way that they think about their pain, this goes hand in hand with helping them develop behavioral habits that are effective from a coping standpoint as well. 
This can be done by, by role playing uh, through we, another set of three P's that we talk about, prioritizing, planning or scheduling, and, and pacing that we found to be very, very effective in managing some of this uh, difficult thinking. Also, uh, a key part of CBT and, and many sorts of psychological therapies are providing uh, periodic booster sessions or educational sessions aimed at helping young people maintain the gains that they've made and to help them to avoid slipping back into negative patterns that make it more difficult to cope with their pain. Now, relaxation is one tool that's commonly used in, in uh, psychological approaches to pain. There are several different ways of, uh, of teaching relaxation. We like to use a very broad approach where we teach young people a variety of different sorts of, of strategies, including uh, progressive muscle relaxation or tension exercises, suggestion, visualization, or imagery, and also diaphragmatic breathing. These are not the only ways to relax. Uh, there are many, many ways. And one of the great things about the technology and so many young people carrying around uh, iPods, MP3 players, is uh, some of the benefit of music as well uh, for their uh, use of, of relaxation. These strategies and others can be combined very effectively. Um, it's important as we do that, as we work with young people, that we, we teach them how to effectively use it. We teach them how to be patient with that, because like any other skill, it's important that we practice these things. This can be used effectively as part of a problem-solving approach and, and really has to be practical and usable for a young person. Sometimes as healthcare providers or parents, then we need to do some work periodically with teachers or school staff or others in the community to help facilitate young people being able to use these and other strategies. Relaxation has probably been most commonly studied in headache and has been found to be effective both for headache and, and in other sorts of chronic pain uh, problems. What's interesting to note, though, is relaxation alone across studies has not been found to be effective when used as the sole uh, psychological strategy. However, when used as a part of a package approach or as a part of a program, it does add unique variants. So there is some value when used with other sorts of psychological strategies. Social support is key, and, and whether that's a part of your program or not, recognizing the fact that that chronic pain affects a young person's interaction with society and society's beliefs about their pain and about that person's pain have a dramatic impact upon them. Social support can be very helpful for a young person to express themselves and to talk about the impact of their pain on them. Peer modeling can be a very useful way to yoke on uh, to the benefits of, of, of positive and helpful peers. It can be also be a, this can also be a great place to reinforce successful coping and effective coping strategies. Oftentimes, these sorts of support groups are led by the people themselves who have pain, and uh, they're generally, oftentimes, unstructured. We use social support as a part of our of our hospital programs as well, and I found that to be, in many cases, more effective than individual delivery of some of our programs. What's really exciting now as well with the advent of uh, many sorts of distance and online programs and uh, the, the, I guess the savvy that young people show with these sorts of electronic modalities, more and more these sorts of uh, treatments are being provided online for young people and, and the outcomes are very, very promising. Now some of the more traditional psychological methods that are used, um, again oftentimes in combination, includes operant conditioning. What we look at are those triggers of pain, what behaviors accompany those triggers or, or result from those triggers, and the consequences of those things. And, and this sort of uh, approach is, is interwoven with CBT and other sorts of psychological approaches. These approaches, in particular for, for young children, can be especially effective, whether we're using positive reinforcement or appropriate coping or being more adherent to treatments that will help the young person. Negative reinforcement, which means removing um, uh, reinforcers or, or positive things as a way of uh, hopefully motivating young people to engage in some of these strategies. We, we tend to shy away from using punishment. They, this tends to be one of the less effective ways of, of teaching and, and promoting good healthy practice. But differential reinforcement or reinforcing uh, good and appropriate and useful strategies 
and, and then not reinforcing unhelpful strategies is often very helpful as well. This can be a lot of fun, and particularly these sorts of strategies we found to be quite useful with young children. Uh, sometimes it's helpful and important to focus on pain behavior, and when we talk about pain behavior, what we mean is any sort of behavior that occurs that communicates with people around us that we have pain. Sometimes, unfortunately, pain behavior can get a little bit out of control and, and can contribute to the disability. I would suggest that pain behavior is sometimes instrumental. In my experience over the years with young people who tend to show more pain behavior, they tend to be the ones who have been disbelieved. And so I often look at pain behavior as, as a negative consequence of the societal impact of, uh, of chronic pain on, on the young person. Uh, we strive, as has been mentioned earlier, to help young people increase their activity and thereby de decrease the disabling effects of chronic pain on, on them. Classical conditioning is, is a little bit complicated, but can be very, very useful. Pavlov and his dogs from many, many years ago are at, at the root of this. We are complicated. People are complicated. And pain is a very, very negative event. Over time, what can happen if, if pain is paired with an activity, such as exercise, um, avoidance for that activity that creates or increases pain is a very natural thing to have happen. And a fear of those triggers um, can become a, a natural, almost unconscious response. It's important to recognize when these sorts of contingencies occur uh, to help the young person recognize those things and then help them work their way through changing some of these, uh, some of these things. Unfortunately, this fear avoidance cycle where we normally and naturally try to avoid things that cause us more pain can be related to negative thinking, uh, mood changes, uh, lack of uh, physical fitness, and, and even more pain. I won't speak much here about biofeedback and hypnosis. Biofeedback uh, goes hand in hand very nicely with, um, with relaxation. Uh, it's been validated and is useful for headache and, and other sorts of uh, pain management or pardon me, chronic pain syndromes. Biofeedback requires some equipment typ typically, uh, and so uh, the availability of, of this strategy may vary from place to place. Hypnosis has also been found to be effective uh, for managing pain. Hypnosis is something that should be practiced by someone who's been properly trained and uh, should be used appropriately. And um, Dr. Leora Kuttner is an excellent example of someone who has used hypnosis with great benefits for, for many young people and has been a great advocate for this, this method of pain management. Now very briefly to close, I, I thought I would outline very quickly how many of these strategies can be packaged together. Um, people will say, great, you've, you've spoken about how we might do this or some general theories, but, but how is it actually delivered? And, and so we've done this in, in a series of 10 sessions with the young people here at Stollery. And this program has been adopted elsewhere. The, the key focus of session one, be that in a group setting or individually, is trying to help the young people understand that we believe them, we're here to teach them everything that we can, and that we're there to support them, as has already been outlined uh, by our previous presenters today. Listening is critical, and, and believing and supporting these young people is a key component. As, as Alan mentioned, if we miss out on them at the beginning, uh, it can become a real uh, impediment to the rest of the process. We then focus for seven weeks on skill building, and I'll talk about some of those skills after, many of which I've already touched on. We bring those skills together into a very concrete plan, uh, a day-to-day -day plan, prioritizing using prioritizing planning and pacing, but also a setback plan for when that pain flares. And finally, we try to help them incorporate these things and generalize them into their lives. These are what the sessions look like, and you'll notice here that uh, the strategies, be they operant, conditioning, relaxation, are all used in, in combination in a very structured and, and manualized way. These sessions also focus on some of the key consequences of pain, including depression, negative thinking, anxiety, different stress responses and coping, as well as significantly impacted sleep in many of the young people that we see. Fortunately, there's some good evidence that these sorts of programs can be effective, and locally we've seen young people dramatically increase their function, oftentimes return to school and even work for the students, the older students. Sleep tends to improve fairly significantly. 
we are very happy when we see a dramatic increase in social activities, uh, also improvement in mood, and, and sometimes, oftentimes, reduced pain as well. And I welcome any questions that you might have. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, there was one question that was uh, directed to you. Um, someone was asking if you could give an example of how negative reinforcement would work in operant conditioning. Okay. So negative reinforcement um, could be used. Uh, in some cases, that's used as a removal of privileges. Um, what, uh, what one does is, in order to try to increase a desired behavior, if the young person isn't engaging in that behavior, uh, then we might remove a privilege until they begin to en engage in a behavior that would be helpful for them. So for example, um, a young person needs to do their physiotherapy exercises. We encourage them to do that. We, we reinforce them when they do their exercises. If they don't, we might say something like, um, you won't have access to your PlayStation until you've completed your uh, your physiotherapy exercises for the day. Thank you. And we're just handing over to, um, we had one more question while uh, Anne's getting ready. Uh, are the 10 sessions available in a web-based format for Youth in Canada? Uh, they're not available yet, but, but we do uh, make this program available. Uh, to other programs, and if you're interested in using that, don't hesitate to contact me. I'd be glad to share that with you. All right, thanks, Bruce. Um, Thank you. We're we're running just a just a few minutes behind, so we're going to go right into uh, a, sort of a whirlwind tour of Canada. We've been in uh, Toronto, Halifax, Edmonton, and now back to Toronto with Anne Ellen Campos uh, at the Hospital for Sick Children. So over to you, Anne. Thank you. As um, I get forward to go. Th through at a rapid pace to keep us on time. I will uh, try to fit everything in. It's been uh, really nice hearing the previous talks because you'll see how nicely they'll segue into the final talk and how everything is used in an interactive mode. Uh, the objectives for today is really just to have a look at what the recommendations are for some physical management in uh, pediatric chronic pain, to highlight just a few of the active and passive physical strategies. By no means is this an exhaustive list. It's just a brief outline of what's available. And to really, while we're going through this section, to see how there's an interdependence of physical strategies, psychological and pharmacological strategies. We all work together for the outcome of a return to function for our children. To get us started, I'm going to just start right in there with a bold statement. Um, physical therapy is often viewed as a cornerstone in the treatment of chronic pain. You'll often hear this, and I think one of the reasons it is is often functionally that's what children and parents see, and often a provider of that tends to be a therapist. And essentially, a survey across Canada done recently in the interdisciplinary pain programs 75% of those pain programs do have a physiotherapist on the team. It was the most common non-physician member, and that speaks to, uh, again, the importance of having a physical intervention specialist on the team. Uh, more recently, in a pediatric multidisciplinary program, there was a nice paper put out that showed that with all the recommendations coming from a multi-dimensional program, adherence to physical therapy tended to be the highest, specifically if families had been exposed to physical therapy in the past. And uh, again, that just speaks to the importance of therapy uh, in a physical manner. We're going to head into our poll question. What therapy should be considered to fall under the umbrella of physical interventions? A heat and cold therapy, B, exercise therapy, C, acupuncture therapy, D, massage therapy, and E, all of the above. All right, nicely done. 97% feel that it's all of the above. And right now, massage therapy is sounding quite good um, as we get to the end of our day. But moving into that, really, physical management is uh, interlacing of many interventions. Traditionally, we think of 
physical therapy and occupational therapy as the providers of physical interventions. But in our modern day world of cultural influences and ethnic influences, we really need to be open and be able to address the other therapies that are referred to often as complementary and alternative therapies. And um, they are certainly becoming much more uh, used much more in the realm of pediatric pain. In the States, the uh, NIH, they have a specific uh, center that looks at the use of complementary and alternative medicines in pediatrics. And in 2007, they looked at what was most popular. And certainly, about 20% of the pediatric population takes um, remedies from the CAM community, mostly in the form of chiropractic and osteopath osteopathy, uh, deep breathing, yoga, homeopathic treatments, traditional healers, and finally massage and meditation. And so as clinical practitioners, people who do assessments of these families and children, we need to be cognizant that part of the physical interventions are outside of our normal traditional setting. And so we need to ask families if they are using such interventions and how helpful these interventions are. Because really to date, uh, the literature on the complementary medicines are coming forward, but certainly not well done in a pediatric uh, group setting. Looking ahead at uh, why we do the things that we do, Really, this uh, character is to show us that the evidence-based material for physical interventions, really, where is it hiding? Because often when you're looking as a therapist, somebody providing interventions, it's really difficult to find randomized controlled trials, children, and interventions in chronic pain management. Specifically, I'm referring to specific interventions. There are several studies that I'll speak to later on that support the use of a multidisciplinary team approach to managing chronic pain. And I think we also need to keep in mind has been highlighted very nicely by the previous speakers that children, teenagers, are definitely not little adults and that uh, translating empirical evidence used in adult studies and just transitioning that to children isn't always the best way to move forward. And so as a group, we need to certainly push forward and look at specific studies for children. Changing veins for a moment, we're going to move on and look at uh, pain. The next poll question, is it necessary to decrease a child's pain before initiating an active exercise program? Is this statement true or false? I'm glad to see that everyone's still awake and active this afternoon. I agree, it is false. If we were to wait for the child's pain to subside, we would never get in and help in returning that child to be functional again. I really like this um, next slide because the goal of physical interventions, really the final goal, as we have heard from our previous speakers and as we all well know, is to improve the function of a child or a teenager. And in order to do that, we have many interventions that we can use at our fingertips. I've lumped them into two groups, the one group on the far left-hand side of the slide, the manual therapy, electrotherapy, the use of thermal agents such as heat and cold. I like to think of that group more as a passive type of therapy. It's something that's sort of done to the child that they find comforting. And then in this middle box, it's more of an active box in terms of active exercises, an active participation in education and self-management. And over time, we want to be able to tip the scale so that initially, as therapists, we may rely a little more heavily on the passive modalities. And as we can, in reducing pain, then rely on tipping the scale more progressively to active exercise. And so as therapists, we're always monitoring and effectively using passive and active exercises with the intent to fully move to active exercise and then improve, improving function. 
the science behind the physical interventions. I'll just briefly allude to this, and um, certainly if you'd like more information on this, there's a wonderful uh, book out by Kathleen Sulpa for Mechanisms of Management for Pain for Physical Therapists. But just to briefly highlight, we know as sort of scientists that uh, know the body well that we can affect pain through certain systems. The gait control mechanism, which uh, as therapists will often utilize using a TENS machine, a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulator, we'll speak of later, accesses the gait control mechanism. And what that does is it interferes with the activation of the large diameter afferents that helps to reduce the nociceptive activity at the level of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The second area is actively uh, using activity or touch as a counter irritant. And what that does is when you apply a painful stimulus, it will activate the endogenous pain control mechanisms, which again will help to reduce pain. And things like this would be as a therapist working with a child with chronic um, pain, such as perhaps uh, complex regional pain syndrome, part of the programming, because they are very uh, sensitive to touch, would be gradual introduction of desensitizing by using textures for touch. So that's activating that system. The third area is activating the endogenous opioid pathways, and that's most familiar to therapists. We can activate that by using aerobic exercise, also by using a certain type of TENS. And what that does is it reduces the activity in the dorsal horn and decreases the input to the higher brain centers. And so all of these ways of activating and interrupting the pain system works on it in a peripheral and a central network with the goal of reducing central sensitization, which um, has been alluded to previously by the Dr. Dick. Moving along and looking at uh, thermal agents, that's really the use of heat and cold. And uh, we know that heat will allow for the increase of blood flow that lets the tissue become more extensible. That really allows the muscles to decrease, become relaxed, reduce the muscle spasm. And in therapies, what's really helpful is we have a lot of the advantages of heat, hot packs, whirlpools, fluid therapy. And as the picture here shows, what's really helpful for kids is getting them in an environment that they can move in, such as a hydrotherapy pool or a um, larger whirlpool bath. And it, when you can move in a heated water setting, it gives the child and teenager confidence to move once again while their pain is being temporarily uh, reduced through the use of heat. Cold, it uh, decreases the nerve activation and conduction. It uh, also helps to give a child a feeling of numbness after leaving that on for 10 minutes. And really, cold works as an analgesic and, again, interferes with the pain messages. Basically, the thermal agents, they create a change in the tissue temperature, and with those changes, you get changes happening at a cellular level, which then help in a reduction of pain. And there's some nice reviews for how pain is affected through the Cochrane um, data piece in 2007 about uh, musculoskeletal pain being very effectively treated with thermal agents. I quite like this picture at the moment because who would not like a massage? Most definitely we all know the benefits of touch, manual therapy, massage. It activates the descending inhibitory pathways by using oxytocin and possibly the serotogenic systems. It produces an analgesic effect. You get increased blood flow, muscle spasms are reduced. This then will help with increasing movement. You get the irritants being taken away and an overall reduction in pain. And you can use this massage as an adjunct moving into getting the child to be more active. There's some nice literature out right now. I'll just highlight uh, the second point here in terms of a randomized control trial done in children with sickle cell disease where parents in the one group were taught 
specific massage techniques in both lying on the stomach and lying on the back. They provided this massage nightly to their child with sickle cell for a month. And at the end of the month, children in a control group, which didn't receive any therapy, it was found that the children that received nightly massage certainly had the benefits of having increased functional levels and lower levels of depression, anxiety, and pain. There are some other studies as well with uh, massage being reported to be helpful in psychiatric conditions and in juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Moving on to our third question in the poll today, which are the following statements about TENS, that's transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, is false. A, TENS can be self or therapist administered. B, TENS has few contraindications. C, TENS is a non-invasive adjunct in pain control. D, TENS is not recommended for use in children. I'm glad you're all still with me. Wonderful. TENS is not recommended for use in children. Quite the opposite, actually. Um, electrical stimulation really does interfere with the transmission of pain. Uh, it alters at the level of the spinal cord, so we take advantage of that gating mechanism. So you do get an analgesic effect, and it may also be, cause endorphin release. It really depends on the type of TENS protocol being delivered. But essentially, as you can see in this highlighted picture, a TENS unit is very portable, battery operated, very lightweight. It's programmed by the therapist, but can be modified by the patient so that the patient does not fall into the trap of having a TENS tolerance. Um, children, as long as you approach them with the right introduction to the use of TENS, children as young as eight can benefit from the use of TENS. And often it can be done in a manner that it could be used on the parent first, or it could be used on the child's non-affected side so that they can be introduced to this sensation of tingling quite slowly and in an acceptable manner. Once TENS is being accepted by the child, it can then be used while the child participates in an active exercise program in a therapy setting. The evidence for TENS, there is multiple studies in the adult literature, especially for its effectiveness in low back pain control and in headache control. It does have a better reputation for success in musculoskeletal pain, in rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis conditions. But there is a very nice use of TENS in procedural pain um, by Lander in 1993, and it was a very nice trial where it had a sham TENS and a actual TENS group and a control group that didn't have anything at all. Essentially, when used appropriately for procedural pain, TENS really helped in reducing pain scores and the pain affect of the child. Their grimaces were less. Their uh, facial expressions were much more closer to a normal look than to a painful look. And so I do know that more studies of its use in children in chronic pain needs to come to the table, but certainly it's emerging. Moving along, we're just looking at another area of acupuncture. And at this point, you know, who really likes needles? When you mention acupuncture in a clinical setting, you often see many of the children's faces just go into a look of horror. But certainly, if it's presented in the right manner, can be very tall, it can be tolerated very well by many of the children. It's essentially, for those who may not be familiar, it's the practice of inserting fine needles into the skin at classic points. And that these points are highly correlated with myofascial trigger points, especially in the treatment of musculoskeletal pain. And acupuncture is thought to cause an increase in serotonin and encephalins, which inhibits the nociceptor pathways. And uh, again, there's a large body of evidence for acupuncture in adults, but in children, much less. Just to point out that it can be used quite nicely in children, there was a very nice study done with 43 children where they used laser acupuncture compared to a placebo acupuncture over a four-week session. And it was mainly done for headache. And at the end of the month session, the number of headaches month were significantly reduced 
in the treatment group, speaking to the benefits of acupuncture. And just looking at pain and how pain can create a spiral. Um, graphically, what I like to think about is a sort of tornado funnel and pain being at the center. What happens is that pain will limit activities. If you're act inactive for quite a while, then that would lead to progressively becoming deconditioned. Deconditioning also will lead to a disability. And this is a spiraling system. And as interventionalists, we need to be able to interrupt this pattern. And it was really nicely done in the last talk, how that's done with the help of thoughts and emotions. And again, with the interventions that we can use in physical interventions, we have many. And really what leads us forwards here is that, as we know, a tornado funnel leads to destruction. A pain spiraling funnel leads to a child or a teen relatively in a state of destruction because it means they can't play, they can't participate in sports, they're inactive, they become socially isolated by their peer group, and we really need to reverse this system. And really, what is our standard for physical activity in Canada? For youths aged 10 to 12, in our poll question, what is the daily recommended moderate activity output? And moderate relates to things such as a brisk walk, swimming, bicycle riding. How many minutes? What is the recommendation for our youth? Is it A, 20 minutes, B, 30 minutes, C, 60 minutes, or D, 90 minutes? That's a very close tie. I see that you're thinking quite well here. B and C are quite close. The actual answer is 60. We have the recommendation of 60 minutes for moderate plus 30 minutes for vigorous. So in essence, really, our youth, age 10 to 14, should have 90 minutes of active exercise daily. And now how many of us know that the children out there are getting that? It's uh, a standard we wish we could all get our kids to adhere to. And as a therapist, that's what we want to be able to do, get these children who've been living a life of chronic pain gradually and progressively with success back to moderate exercise, most definitely. We know that exercise is going to activate the endogenous system, which uh, allows for pain-inhibiting systems to kick in. General consensus in the literature is that exercise does improve aerobic fitness. It improves energy, sleep, and mood. And what this does is overall improves the quality of life. Quite possibly, it can also help in the reductions of medication and overall pain scores. And how do we do this? How do you get a child who comes in that's barely walking back onto a bicycle? Well, essentially, with the help of the pharmacological and psychological interventions, the physical interventions start with a, pro a progressive uh, log of exercise. Increasing the exercise and recording the exercise is really helpful. Recording exercise is important for patient compliance. And at the end of the week, to show the patient their improvement. It's done in combination with pacing activities and always making the goal successful for the child to achieve. It's really done through structured fitness programming and uh, we know through studies that this type of programming is safe and acceptable. It's been shown in juvenile arthritic, arthritic patients and overall again the results show that exercise is improved through its exercise capacity, being able to perform activities of daily living, and the overall quality of life. In Canada, um, we often try to refer to an inpatient rehabilitation program because we know through the literature a comprehensive multidisciplinary program is best suited for success with pediatric chronic pain. Um, for most patients, they can be managed in the community by accessing all these services, but there is a small group of children who really only benefit from an inpatient program. And I um, have to admit that right now there are certainly a lack of inpatient programs in Canada for such management. There are such programs in the States, and that's where most of the literature is coming out of. And to 
move along as well, the other active box I referred to earlier, yes, was the education part along with active exercise and everything else. And I've termed this pain class 101. Really, education begins at the first session, and it continues throughout with each subsequent visit so that the children and teenagers really understand what was uh, alluded to earlier as the hurt versus the harm. Children need to be educated so they can be knowledgeable, and all of this will translate to self-management for pain relief and for participation in activities. And it's not just the child, it's also the parent, because we need our parents to be able to support the therapeutic interventions that we are recommending. It's critical for progress and for that progress to be maintained. And I just wanted to say that all of these physical interventions are certainly not done in isolation, as mentioned earlier, and they are certainly not done without the complements of pharmacological and psychological interventions as well. And I think I'll wrap up there and uh, put forth any questions. If, I, if there's any time, which I think we've run out of. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. We, we, have, uh, we have pretty much run out of our scheduled time, although we do have the vast majority of people that uh, started on the webinar are still out there in attendance. So uh, f at least for the sake of uh, the recording, which will be made available afterwards, I think we might as well go ahead and answer some of the questions. And if people have to drop off, of course, by all means, then they, then they can just leave. Um, I think we had uh, a question from way back at the beginning that was directed to or in relation to the content provided by Dr. Stinson. Um, Jennifer, if you wouldn't mind uh, just going ahead and answering that question. Sure. So the question was a great one. It was, um, how would you go about assessing chronic pain in a child who is nonverbal and has no way of communicating but shows signs of chronic pain? Um, and again, this is is crucial. We often do see these kids um, with um, neurocognitive um, disorders or developmentally delayed or with autism coming into our clinic and the parents are saying, I'm, I'm positive my child has some sort of pain problem. They're showing these behaviors and really we have to rely on the vital role of the parents in telling us things like changes in their behavior, how has it changed their appetite, their mood, um, vocalizations, are they doing self-injurious behavior, and so all of those things can help us um, figure out whether the child's in pain or not, and often we rely on the parent and then we develop a treatment plan um, and trial um, either medications, physical strategies, and some relaxation, um, massage, those types of things to see what works and what doesn't work, um, and sometimes it, obviously it's by trial and error. Um, but really the key is involving parents. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no um, assessment measure specifically developed um, for children who are cognitively impaired with chronic pain, but Lynn Bro has done probably the most work in this area developing pain measures, um, acute pain measures for cognitively impaired children. And we've used some of those measures with parents to give them a guidepost of behaviors they want to look at. Um, I don't know if Alan or anyone else, Bruce, has any other comments on that. Um, sure, uh, this is Alan. Um, in fact, uh, Lynn Bro's uh, uh, non-communicating children's uh, pain checklist, I think, works for a variety of types of long-term or recurrent pain, and we certainly use it for that. We'll provide the instructions and um, the check the uh, scoring sheets to parents and they can take them home and use them over a period of time. Um, that's often quite helpful if for no other reason than to provide a measurable uh, measurable evidence a number that helps other physicians and health uh, providers believe what parents are telling them. Um, that would be my, uh, that, but that's well worth uh, using, um, and uh, you, people can email me if they want uh, a link to the information on that, uh, that pain measure. Um, shall I, uh, there are a couple of questions as well that were passed to me about uh, drugs.
two questions. Um, one is how long does it take for gabapentin and tricyclics to work, and how often should the titrations occur? Uh, we usually tell uh, people that uh, gabapentin certainly, and even pregabalin, may take a couple of weeks to show an effect. And because we're usually titrating those drugs up over um, every few days or f or a week or so. Uh, the the individual patient's effective dose may not uh, be found right away. In fact, although that's what we tell them, we've had a lot of lots of patients with peripheral nerve injuries that notice an effect from gabapentin even after the first dose. So it can be quite dramatic uh, in some types of pain. Uh, the real problem with that type of chronic pain is that we don't know ahead of time which pains are going to respond to drugs like gabapentin and which ones aren't. Um, the pains look the same, but some, some respond well and some don't, and so we're still in a trial and error situation, which is obviously frustrating for everybody, but uh, that's, that's what we've got. If you break your leg or if you have appendicitis, you can be pretty sure that morphine is going to work. If you have a peripheral neuropathy, Gabapentin might work really well, or it might not work at all. Amitriptyline might work, or it might not work at all. Amitriptyline uh, takes longer to to kick in effectively, and we certainly tell them it may be a number of weeks, and we titrate up. Um, you can try titrate amitriptyline up as quickly as every three or four days, but we don't usually do it that fast, and we give people time to become acclimatized. The other <coughs> question that um, was passed to me was about how early you can diagnose a child with chronic pain. I'm presuming how early in the pain uh, that the, the question is. Um, I, a lot of us object um, to the concept of chronic pain um, being pain that's, that's lasted more than three months. Um, I don't know of any scientific evidence for a three-month period, and I wonder if that isn't just historical and related more to insurance and workman's compensation uh, patterns in adults than it is to uh, physiology. Um, I think you can identify neuropathic pain quite often very quickly within days, and you shouldn't wait for three months to see if it's going to last before you institute appropriate treatment. Um, um, I, I, the, the, that's the problem in my mind with having a fixed uh, time frame because it gives people the idea that they can wait and watch these conditions uh, instead of uh, treating them early. Uh, no matter what it is, the earlier you get uh, working on it, the more likely you are to have a good outcome. And uh, so. Um, we don't like to set a particular uh, time frame at all. Um, another question on clonidine, <clears throat> which I didn't mention in my talk, um, there's very limited evidence for clonidine in uh, chronic pain. Uh, there are a couple of studies in headache from quite a few years ago, which I think contradict each other, uh, and there's no real studies in ongoing pain. Uh, having said that, uh, we certainly do use it occasionally, and other people do as an adjunct uh, to other medications and other treatments. It sometimes helps with sleep, um, and of course, sleep interruption makes chronic pain worse. Chronic pain makes sleep worse, so uh, anything you can do to break that cycle can be helpful. But we use, uh, if we use clonidine, we start with small doses and we don't use it very aggressively because, as I said, there isn't really strong evidence for a, a primary role in, in uh, chronic pediatric pain. Um, I'll pass over to others now.
Uh, Dr. Dick, um, we did have a question about the use of child life specialists uh, when working with your chronic pain, and I'll just give you a little background on that question. We do have, and I'm not sure, not sure if you've seen the surveys, we do have a large number, uh, large percentage of child life specialists participate in uh, in this session, which would probably be prompting the interest in this question. But if any of you want to comment for the benefit of the audience uh, or for the child life specialists out there uh, about the, the use of child life specialists in your pain management. Comments. We uh, here at Stollery have um, benefited tremendously from, from the Child Life Department. We're, we're fortunate to have um, many, pr probably not enough, but, but still many excellent, excellent Child Life workers who uh, work on the wards and who also uh, will even do some work with outpatients. They do all kinds of tremendous work, including uh, helping kids with, uh, with chronic pain issues, acute pain issues. Um, and, and oftentimes are the ones who provide the ongoing support with, with many of these strategies for kids. I think there is, is a real role for them and uh, a way that uh, we could all work hand-in-hand -hand with them. Thanks. Um, are there any, I think we're pretty, I think we've exhausted the questions. Are there any other final comments from any of our panelists? All right, hearing none, I think we will uh, we will draw this to a close. So thanks to uh, to Anne uh, Aileen Compost, Dr. Jennifer Stinson, uh, Bruce Dick, and Alan Finley. Uh, again, a great presentation, lots of uh, great content, um, and I think it's really interesting to see the, the the variety of practitioners and backgrounds that have all been involved in this work, from nurses, physicians, physiotherapists in the audience. We've got respiratory therapists, child life specialists. It really is a topic that is uh, of uh, it cuts across all professions and all uh, settings of care. So I think this has really been great that uh, the CHR has funded this team to do this work and that they've done such great work. So a big thank you to all of the presenters and to the Canadian Institutes for Health Research for, for providing funding for all of this work and for this webinar series. And if you're interested in learning more or about uh, pain in children and youth, we do have the previous two presentations available on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network, which you can find at www.ken.cafc.org, and there's a category on children's pain. We will be having all of the information from this webinar posted there. The PowerPoint presentations will be posted shortly, and the full video of this will be uh, will be posted in a few days. We also have a list of some of the references that were used in this uh, session as well. So once again, thank you to all of the presenters and to all of the audience for coming. We will be having we will be continuing this series on children's pain. We don't have specific topics and dates yet, but uh, keep an eye on your email as you will be updated when. We do have new topics available and the dates. They will be. This, we won't be having another webinar until the new year on children's pain, but we plan to have at least three more topics presented at some time in 2011. So thanks again to everyone for coming and to the presenters, and we will see you in the new year.